I know that at your age, privacy is probably really important to you, and you do deserve it uh, for sure. You you deserve you know kind of your basic human rights and stuff. But in some cases, getting issues like self harm and depression out there in the open is really one of the most important ways that you can start dealing with them. And often for these issues, it does take more of a community approach, you know, family members, other supports to be involved and understand what's going on to make a real difference. Hey, everybody. Before we start the show, I want to make a couple disclaimers. This show does cover a wide variety of topics related to mental health and life in general, and some of those could be sensitive for you. I want to simultaneously encourage you to be brave in consuming difficult content, but also respect and recognize your limitations. So please use your best judgment. I will never be offended if you need to skip a question or an episode entirely, but feel free to feel it out, check out the episode, and just see what happens. If you need to skip, that's okay, but you know, feel free to give it a shot first. I also need to say that while I am a psychologist, I'm not your psychologist, and I'm not your therapist. This is not intended to be direct medical advice, and you should not use this as a substitute for professional help. So with those said, let's go ahead and get into the show. All right. Hello, friends of all varieties. This is the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast, episode 288. I'm your host, Dr. Robert Duff, aka Duff the Psych. I make mental health content for real people, just like you. And today I have a question and answer episode for you. Uh, Two really good questions, not quite as intense as last episode, um, but some really interesting stuff. So we're going to be talking about um, confidentiality for minors in therapy. And we're also going to be talking about... um, basically the difference between physical health issues and mental health issues. So I'll get into more detail there. If you guys want to send me in a question, please do so. Uh, you can shoot me an email to duffthepsych at gmail.com. That's the best way to send me questions. I don't really look on social media for them. In fact, whenever you guys send me one on social media, I just redirect you to email. So please do that. Um, and the contact form is also okay. I had a question about that recently, but the contact form on my website, duffthepsych.com, is also perfectly good comes to the same place. But yeah, DuffThePsych at gmail.com. Today should be a uh, maybe a little bit of a shorter episode. Um, I don't have any sponsors today. So um, in lieu of a sponsor spot, I just want to remind you that I have recently put out a book of journal prompts. It's called 500 Journal Prompts for Mental Health, Creativity, and Personal Exploration. I've gotten a ton of really good feedback about it. Um, the only piece of negative feedback that I've gotten truly is people who want room to write in the book. So it's not um, a journal that you can write in. It's a little kind of pocket-sized book, you know, if you have big pockets <laughs> or like a small purse. Um, but it's it's like a small book, you know, about palm-sized. And all it is is a quick introduction, you know, talking about the role of journaling, how to journal, and then literally just a numbered list of 500 different prompts that I came up with. And so some people have wanted, you know, a book where they can actually look at the prompt and write into the book directly. I didn't do that initially because I thought it was going to be just a big behemoth of a book and, you know, kind of like a waste of paper and things like that. But um, if you're in the camp that would like a version of this where there's actually room to write inside, please let me know. I'm I'm not sure how many people really want that, if it's just a vocal minority or if uh, it's something that a lot of people would want. So feel free to give me some feedback um, on any platform about that. But the journal prompts themselves... I remain super happy with, and I use them often for myself when I'm journaling. Um, so let me give you a let me give you a random sampling. I've done this a few times, but let me uh, open to a random page here. Um, so let's see, um, we're in the 400, so 476. Write three things that you have done well today. 477. I wish blank knew that I blank. So fill in the blank one. Uh, let's see. 487, what feelings do you have about your name? Were you named after anyone? Would you change your name if you could easily? Um, 485, where will you be in five years if your physical health continues on its current trajectory? And let's see, one more. 491, in what ways are you different than your parents or primary caregivers? How does that impact your relationship with them? So there's some stuff in here that's, you know, pretty deep, as you can hear, some stuff that's uh, a little more fun, some stuff that's for creativity or exploration, um, and then some things that are, you know, more explicitly about mental health. 
So if you want to check that out, just go over to Amazon. You could either search my name, Robert Duff, or you can search 500 journal prompts and it'll pop up on the first page there. Um, and thank you to all of you who have already purchased it and left a review. If you've gotten the book and you have not left a review, please do. It really, really, really helps me out. Um, so with that said, let's go ahead and get into the questions. Here's the first one. Okay, so question one reads, hey there, I have a question for you. Uh, some background, I'm under 18. I have a seasonal disorder that makes me get depressed and anxious, but every year it gets worse. I don't try to self-harm, but now I am doing it in other forms, like taking a cold shower or hitting myself. So the question is, could my therapist tell my parents that I'm self-harming in this way? Is it the same thing as cutting yourself or different? Love the podcast and have a nice day. Um, so really good question. Uh, thank you for that. I appreciate it. And so the question is basically, you know, is this form of self-harm or self-punishment, uh, sensation seeking, whatever it might be for you, is this the same as cutting yourself when it comes to the rules of therapy for a minor? And to be honest, it's a little bit complicated, but I'm going to get into it and, and do my best to answer this for you in a way that's helpful. Um, so as somebody who is under 18, uh, your rights to privacy are likely different than they would be for an adult in most cases, um, because your parent or guardian, and I'll probably use those interchangeably, but you know, obviously you can have anybody who is your guardian, not just a biological parent here, um, but your parent or guardian is the one who is consenting to your treatment. So they're the one giving permission for treatment to occur. And there are a bunch of complex laws governing privacy and treatment for minors, meaning people who are under the age of 18. Um, this is both at the federal, uh, so like the whole country level, and at the state level. And this is assuming that you're in the United States, right? There are different rules in different countries, um, but even within the country here in the U.S., there are a bunch of different laws at you know different levels. And so some of the answer to this question for you is going to depend on where you live what state you live in, if you're in the U.S. again. <laughs> it sounds like you are from your question, but I'm not going to assume that you are. Um, but in general, you know, if you are consenting to your own treatment for some reason, so for instance, if you're independently seeking treatment in a state where you're allowed to do so, so uh, California, uh, where I live, you can independently consent to treatment if you're over the age of 12. And, and there's some, you know, uh, caveats to that, like you need to be able to... Um, you know, logistically manage it yourself. You need to be able to get there and pay for it and all of those things. But if you're over the age of 12 and there's a good reason for you to be seeking treatment, um, even if it's without parental consent, you're allowed to do so. And that's not the same in every single um, state. So it's a little bit different depending on where you are. Um, but yeah, if you're in California, you can consent at age 12. If you are an emancipated minor, meaning you are under the age of 18, but you are considered legally an adult, uh, because you've been emancipated. Same thing applies. You can consent for yourself there. And your parents in these cases where you are consenting for yourself, they don't have a right to your records. Your parent or guardian does not have a right to your records because you're independently seeking treatment. Now, in most other cases where that's not happening, your parents or your guardians will have a right to your information. And so at any point, they can obtain a copy of your records. They can, you know, get your full medical record. Um, and in some instances, depending on what the circumstance is with the therapist, information can be shared with them from what goes on in therapy. But that all depends on the arrangement. So with that said, most therapists uh, that work with minors, especially those that work with adolescents, you know, maybe not younger children, but the ones who work with um, adolescents, teenagers, young adults, um, well, I guess young adults would not be <laughs> minors. You know what I mean? Um, but therapists that work with younger people, they're typically going to have their own guidelines about privacy. And they will have the parents or guardians and the children agree to these guidelines prior to beginning treatment. This might be in paperwork or it just might be verbally, you know, there might be a meeting with everybody before the before the kid starts independently in treatment um, to just break it down and talk about what the expectations, what the limits are, things like that. So I think obviously it's it's going to be difficult for you to feel totally comfortable talking about personal, private, um, shameful even information, things that are that are hard for you to talk about. It's going to be even more difficult if you're worried about everything just being reported back to your parents. And that's understandable. And therapists know this. So, you know, many therapists will have guidelines about what is and is not shared with parents. They may uh, actually have a lot of boundaries for the parents saying, 
you don't have a right to know what's set in in session. Um, there are certain limits to that. These are those limits. These are when I would contact you. Um, you can know the gist of things. You can know the general information. But in order for this treatment to work, you don't get to know every single specific thing. It's going to be different for everybody. Um, but this is something that should be discussed prior to beginning treatment. And if you have questions about how your therapist plans on handling these things, please feel free to ask them, even if you've already started. You know, if you already have a relationship with them, you've been working for a while, and it's something that just hasn't been an issue, hasn't come up, you can still bring it up. It's not too late. Um, and it's not a strange topic to talk about. I think confidentiality is something that most any therapist would be very used to discussing because it comes up a lot. It's something that we discuss at the beginning of every you know, treatment circumstance. So it's it's familiar territory for them, and they're not going to be like, why? Why are you asking me this? Um, now, as to the question of whether the specific behavior that you're discussing, you know, these sort of more subtle forms of self-harm, like hitting yourself or taking a cold shower. So the question of whether these things um, in general are uh, reportable or not, uh, you know, generally speaking, these things that you're talking about are not explicitly reportable. Um, now, this is obviously, uh, you know, in a general sense when we're talking about uh, adults, because as a child, that can be a little bit different. Um, but as a mandated reporter, your therapist, um, they're required to act upon certain things that represent emergency situations. You know, if you're planning to hurt yourself, um, if you're going to be attempting to, um, you know, die by suicide, if you are being... Um, abused and you're under the age of 18. That's one that does apply to minors. If you're under the age of 18 and you're being abused, or if you have plans to hurt somebody else, these are things that your therapist would need to report or act upon in terms of either the authorities legally or, you know, working toward a hospitalization of some kind, things like that. Now, self-harm itself can fall into a bit of a gray area here because there are definitely non-suicidal forms of self-injury. A lot of people self-injure and don't ever intend to kill themselves. It's just uh, you know, something they use to uh, you know, ground themselves when they're dissociated, when they're lost from reality, or something they use to you know, uh, exert control over their body. Um, it's something that is sensation-seeking. There's a variety of reasons somebody might harm themselves, and they're not always uh, suicidal in nature. So if it was an adult that was just hitting themselves and taking cold showers or, say, over-exercising, something that's sort of a punishment to themselves, these things would not be reportable as long as the intention here is not to uh, hurt themselves. Now, when it comes to more explicit self-harm, like cutting or other more violent far forms of self-harm, it becomes a little bit more complicated because you can definitely cause serious harm even if that isn't your explicit intent. And... Um, you know, so this th th this is a little bit of a gray area, and there is some clinical judgment that's used there when it's not actually something that's that's suicidal, but it could be harmful. Now, for you, since you are a minor, this is really going to come down to your particular therapist guidelines. Um, I would encourage you to talk to them about these issues, maybe without being specific first. So to ask about confidentiality and what they will and will not be reporting to your parents. So just bringing it up broadly, asking about what their policy is for confidentiality, what they share with your parents, or what they would have to share with your parents. Um, I don't work with adolescents um, or children too often, um, but even with the adult clients that I work with, I talk about confidentiality very often. I, I sort of um, talk about confidentiality broadly and then give them the tools they need to decide what they're comfortable disclosing to me. Um, I'm not a investigator, right? <laughs> I'm not a detective. I'm not a law enforcement officer. I obviously want to try to tease out information that's going to be useful and helpful in treatment and to keep my clients safe, but I can't force them to talk about anything. And I also can't act on things that they don't talk about. So when things start to kind of come to that place where I can tell the person is uncomfortable about whether what they say is going to be, you know, in their mind used against them, I will often pause things and I'll talk about the circumstances that, you know, would and would not lead to breaking confidentiality. You know, so I'll slow down. I'll say, okay, hold on. Um, I can tell you're sort of uh, skirting around this. You're feeling uncomfortable. So I just want to let you remind you about how the confidentiality works. You know, I'll talk about the things that are and are not okay to talk about. And not even in those words. That's the wrong word to use, uh, you know, okay and not. Because they are allowed to talk about them no matter what. But the things that might lead to breaching confidentiality. 
Um, so I also let them know that even if they do have things that fall under that umbrella, if this is something that I would need to act upon, that they're still more than welcome to talk about it because sometimes it can be useful to work together toward a solution. For instance, um, I always prefer to voluntarily hospitalize somebody rather than putting them on an involuntary hold, which is uh, here called a 5150. Um, so I'd much rather work with somebody on that and, and make it a healing experience. So it's okay to talk about these things, but they do have the right to understand what that confidentiality looks like. So you could ask your therapist about, you know, what sort of topics they might uh, share with your parents, what they would have to share, what they would uh, break confidentiality for. Um, you can also ask specific questions. So you can say like, um, okay, listen, I don't plan on causing myself permanent harm. I don't want to die. I want to be here. But there are certain things that I've been dealing with and certain behaviors that I want to talk about, but I'm unsure about whether I can talk about them freely um, without you talking to my parents about them. So can you tell me what would and wouldn't be, you know, sort of under that umbrella? What could I talk to you about? What couldn't I talk to you about in that sort of circumstance? Right. So, you know, uh, just broadly and, and a little bit less specifically. And again, that's still going to be on an individual basis. So your, your therapist is going to have their own policy about that. You know, at the baseline, typically when it comes to the legal situation, um, you don't have a full right to that confidentiality, but the, the, the agreement between, you know, your therapist and your parents will, will matter quite a bit. Now, taking a step back from this, um, I, I want to kind of talk about this in a way that's similar to what I just said about talking with my adult clients about confidentiality. Um, you got to ask yourself, would it be the worst thing if your parents did find out about this? I know that at your age, privacy is probably really important to you, and you do deserve it, uh, for sure. You, you deserve, you know, kind of your basic human rights and stuff. But in some cases, getting issues like self-harm and depression out there in the open is really one of the most important ways that you can start dealing with them. And often for these issues, it does take more of a community approach, you know, family members, other supports to be involved and understand what's going on to make a real difference. Um, a lot of mental health issues, they, they thrive in situations where they can be kept a secret. And so simply having more awareness of what's going on and more accountability to other people can make a huge difference in getting rid of those issues or like making them less um, impactful in your life. Now, that said, I don't know your parents, right? So there are definitely situations where it wouldn't be smart. It would not be smart to tell them things like this. Uh, if you could be punished for it in severe ways, if you could have it held against you, um, if you are being abused in some sort of way, all of that, like I definitely would not want you to put yourself in a situation that is not safe um, by telling them this. But I want you to question the voice that tells you that they cannot know about this. You know, question that automatic voice that says, hide this. You know, don't let anybody know. Um, it's very similar to people that I see in my office who do have really serious suicidal ideation. You know, I explain the limits of confidentiality to them, but then also express that it can be an important part of their journey to sometimes get that out and let other people know about it, even if it leads to some sort of action that, you know, on the surface they don't really want. We're sort of trained, you know, as, as people, at least here in this country, to like do everything we can to avoid hospitalization. You know, we have this bad image of being locked up and stuff like that. Um, but sometimes that is exactly what's called for, whether it's a perfect place or not. Um, sometimes stabilization, getting somebody set back on the right track is what's called for and keeping them safe physically. So similarly here, your instinct may be screaming at you to keep this a secret, but that could also be your mental health difficulties trying to keep themselves safe, trying to keep them, um, you know, secret and in the dark. And, you know, you fearing the potential shame of having to face this with your parents could also be a factor there. So a lot of things that are kind of pushing you to not talk about this. So I hope this gives you some direction. Um, you can't be forced to share anything that you don't want to share. And you are allowed to have a very clear idea and understanding of what the confidentiality uh, agreement is with your therapist before you say anything. So don't be afraid to get clarity on that before you talk. Um, and I also just want to say before I wrap up this question, thank you. Thank you for listening to the show. Um, I'm super proud of you for being interested in improving yourself, trying to take uh, in content that's helpful for you and your mental health at such a young age. I think that's really awesome. And, you know, on a personal note, it's just great to have people from you know, under 18 to over 60 that listen to this show for a variety of reasons. So I appreciate you and thank you for that question. All right, so on to question number two. 
Hey, I recently found your podcast and it's really helped me in my journey of mental health. I've had mental health struggles for the past five years since my dad passed away. And the last year I've struggled really hard with depression and anxiety. I finally got an appointment with my doctor and my aunt suggested I do lab work to check for underlying issues and found that I had hypothyroidism. Everyone says there's a huge connection between that and mental health problems because of the hormonal side, but it's overwhelming. How can I understand how my physical health and mental health relate to each other in this context and how can I fix it? Also, is it possible I have mental health problems outside of this diagnosis? Thank you so much. So yeah, really good. Um, Thank you for this question. I appreciate it. Uh, You are right. (laughs) You know that um, we talk a whole lot about hormones, thyroid issues, other things like that in the physical realm that could serve as a potential source of mental health symptoms. But we don't really talk a whole lot about what to do when you realize that that's actually the case, when there is a physical issue going on that's contributing to your mental health. So for your situation in particular, uh, we're talking about hypothyroidism. So I'm going to give a quick review of what that means for everybody. So the thyroid is a gland in your neck that secretes hormones that help to regulate your body in a variety of ways. It really, uh, you know, thyroid hormone has its hands in a lot of different functions. Um, But important things include like your breathing, your heart rate, uh, your sleep, and also your metabolism. So how you break things down in your body. So when you have an overproduction of thyroid hormones, and I'm saying hormones because there are multiple, there are like two thyroid hormones, and there's also, you know, there are other substances that the uh, thyroid secretes. Um, But when you have an overproduction, sorry, an underproduction of thyroid hormones, that's called hypothyroidism. So that's what we're talking about for you. And then when you have an overproduction of them, that's called hyperthyroidism, hyper, hypo. That's going to be the same for, you know, any medical term. Hypo is under, hyper is over. So generally speaking, uh, hypothyroidism uh, causes symptoms that can mimic depression, and hyperthyroidism causes symptoms that can mimic anxiety. Basically, if you think about even just taking the breathing, heart rate, and metabolism, you slow those down. That makes you have less energy, makes you feel more groggy. That feels a little bit more like depression. When you speed those up, then you're having an accelerated heart rate, accelerated breathing rate, very similar to what you feel when you have uh, you know, physiological symptoms of anxiety. So yeah, it can also be a bit of a cyclical interaction, you know, meaning uh, in a case like yours, hypothyroidism might cause fatigue. It might cause lack of motivation, uh, low energy, and this can make it harder for you to do activities that uh, generate a general sense of reward and happiness. And this can contribute to feelings of depression, right? Because you are doing things or not doing things, (laughs) rather, uh, that make you happy. You don't have the energy to do things. And then you feel bad about not doing things. You are less active. You're, you know, getting less of those happy neurotransmitters. So those uh, receptors start to shut down a little bit, meaning you feel even less of that pleasure and less of that happiness. And so that just kind of drives you further into apathy, lack of motivation, and the cycle continues. Similar thing can happen for hyperthyroidism. You know, the elevation in your body makes you feel as though you're anxious, which in turn causes your anxiety to actually kick off and, uh, you know, take over the wheel and suddenly you're having a panic attack because your body sort of triggered it. So it can definitely be both. You can have underlying mood issues or mental health issues along with the hormonal issues. And then you can have mood that's caused by these hormonal issues. Or you can just have, you know, hormone issues, thyroid issues, and that's the extent of it. So any one of those can be true. I think that one of the most important things you can do uh, to start to tease this apart is make sure that you're getting uh, good medical treatment. So work with your doctors on regulating your thyroid. This could be with medication. Uh, Sometimes it has to do with diet or exercise, sometimes other interventions, and they're going to be the ones to guide you on that. In some cases, if you're with your primary care, they might refer you out to a specialist to better evaluate and manage these issues. But Regardless, making sure that you're, you know, following your doctor's orders and and trying to manage this well is going to be a very important part of this. Um, Once things start to become more under control and your thyroid hormone levels are normal, then you're going to be left with a more clear picture of what you have mental health wise, right? Because you're basically clearing up the part where your body is trolling you. And so what you're left with is the mental health piece. So um, I think for you, it's pretty clear that you've struggled in the mental health department already over the past few years. Um, it seems like there have been some significant life issues that have contributed, contributed to that. And as you said, you've had um, you know, depression and anxiety ever since your dad passed away. And I think that's totally understandable. 
So it could be that, you know, there's been an underlying health issue uh, in terms of the physical health for a while, and that actually made the death of your father or other, you know, um, things that have been difficult in your life even harder to deal with. Um, but it's also reasonable that without those medical issues, you would be struggling just in your own right because that's really hard stuff to deal with. So I think that you might take identifying this physical health issue as just a jumping off point, you know, to start taking great care of yourself in general. If you were to take the next six months to a year as a time of progress for you, where you're just really going to invest in yourself and caring for yourself, I think that could be a really good thing. You know, you can work on getting your thyroid under control through those means that I said before. At the same time, maybe you can work on your physical health and your general habits and your lifestyle in general, since those are also related to mental health. And then finally, you can also get some therapy or whatever psychological intervention or psychiatric intervention you think would be helpful and appropriate to start working more significantly on the anxiety and the depression. Especially when it comes to therapy, regardless of the exact source, um, the tools and insight that you gain through therapy is going to be helpful regardless of whether it's physical or mental or both, all of the above. You know, you're, you're going to be learning the same skills and applying the same sort of things, so it will still be helpful to you. Um, and in the end, if you can make some progress and feel more stable, that's really what matters. In the future, you know, if your physical health remains under control and then you slip back into a period of significant depression and or anxiety, you know that's probably more of a mental health issue than a physical one. Uh, but either way, I think it's worth paying attention to, and I'm glad that you're putting in the legwork to do so. Uh, last thing I'll say about it really is that when in doubt, journal, track things, you know, write down things in a journal and, you know, regularly check in, keep track of your mood, your energy level, any other things that you think would be important to track along with the circumstances of your life, right? So what's going on, how you're feeling physically, what your mood is like, and keep track of that over time, you know, maybe several times a week or something like that. And of course, for any significant event where you're like, okay, I was having a really bad day or I feel like shit, anything like that, you know, you want to write that down so that you can look back on them in the future and look for trends, look for patterns. And of course, you could also bring that into your doctor or specialist to help sort things out and look for those patterns together if need be. So thank you for the question. Um, I, I appreciate it. I think that things are going to start moving in a more positive direction for you soon. And just remember that even without the exact clean perfect answer as to what is causing what, there are still things that you can do that overlap that will give you a sense of wellness and help you out regardless of what the source of those difficulties are. So good luck to you. I appreciate you. And thank you for the question. And with that, that is the end of the episode, guys. This has been episode 288 of the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast. A little bit shorter of an episode, like I said, but I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to send me in a question for a future episode, uh, shoot me an email to deaththepsych at gmail.com. And if you want the full show notes, go to depthpsych.com slash episode 288. Other than that, I hope you're taking really good care of yourselves and I will see you for the next episode. Bye.